Welcome to the Business of College Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Dosh, the Sports Biz Miss. And today I have a type of guest we've never had on Business of College Sports before. I have Jordan Acker. He is the immediate past chair of the Board of Regents at the University of Michigan. Also a partner, he's an attorney at Goodman Acker in Detroit, Michigan. And Jordan's a little different than our average guest in that I don't think we've ever had anybody from the Board of Regents on. In fact, we've only had a few people from the university side on this podcast ever. You know, we uh, so much more often have somebody from the athletic side of things. But Jordan is a passionate fan of not just Michigan, but of college sports. And he was very vocal about his support for NIL, even before NIL rules went into place. And really one of the only vocal supporters of NIL in terms of a regent at a division one institution. So Jordan and I had a great call, just the two of us a few weeks ago, talking about NIL and about the future of college sports. And I thought he would make a great guest so we can hear a little bit about the types of conversations that are being had in a board of regents room when they're talking about NIL and the future of college athletics and the things that concern them about college athletics, but also the things that excite them about the future as well. So I'm going to get out of the way and let you guys hear from Jordan. I really had fun doing this interview and think it was a different perspective on things. Hope you all enjoy it as well. Without further ado, here is my interview with Jordan Acker. This is the Business of College Sports podcast with your host, the founder of businessofcollegesports.com, Christy Dosh. Find her on Twitter and Instagram at sportsbizmiss. Jordan, welcome to the Business of College Sports podcast. Thanks for joining us. So glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Christy. You and I have already had the chance to chat a little bit, and I thought our chat was so interesting that we should uh, bring it to the airwaves so that other people could kind of eavesdrop on our conversation. I think you're the first Board of Regent I've ever had on the podcast, so you can add that to your resume. First Ooh. ever Business of College Sports podcast guest from a Board of Regents. And I just think you bring a different perspective to the table, and most of the folks who listen to this podcast work in or around college athletic departments. And so uh, we're going to dig in on all sorts of interesting things and get your perspective as a regent. But I thought it would be interesting because you've told me this story a little bit already, but if you told folks... How did you become a regent for the University of Michigan? It's a great question. So um, what people don't know is there's only three or four states out there that elect their boards for the universities, either statewide or through districts. In Michigan's a statewide election. There's eight members of the board uh, every two years in Michigan, Michigan State, Wayne State, all have their own boards. So with that set up, um, I, uh, after the, the two things that happened. So first in 2016, um, I got really sick. I had was having issues uh, with back spasms. This is the whole getting older thing. It's no fun. I'm there. And, <laughs> yeah. I feel you. <laughs> I took a medication and my liver shut down. I find myself in and out of U of M Hospital uh, over the course of a summer, and then in in the as I recovered in the fall of 2016, I was sitting. Um, and I was actually looking for tickets to our game against Iowa, which was the Saturday after the election. Mm -hmm. And Michigan was undefeated at that time, as everyone will remember. Mm -hmm. I was really excited about heading out to Iowa City. Um, and I was talking about it with a friend that, I, that was going there, and I stumbled upon the Board of Regents page. I didn't know much about it, um, but I really, I looked at my friend and said, wow, these people are kind of old. <laughs> and says to me, so a friend that I, I worked in the White House with says to me, um, great, you're running. And I <laughs> said, no, look, I, I left Washington. I had a great time, you know, in, in politics and policy. I'm, you know, practicing law. We just started a family. I, thank you. But the thought of statewide office is, is not for me, not right now. And he said, no, you don't, you don't realize it yet. You, you are running and you're going to win. And I said, thank you. We'll go off to Iowa. You know, Michigan loses and all of that happens. And um, I spent some of, the, some of the time thinking about it. And I really did start to feel 
like having a millennial voice on this board was actually really important. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't possibly know what the experience of college is uh, if you haven't experienced it lately. And I will say now being 38 this year um, that I'm even further now removed than I was five years ago when, or yeah. six, when we started doing this. Um, and so keeping that fresh is really important when it comes to a governance perspective. Yeah. Um, in a lot of respects, your senior leadership at university, the only people outside of that institution that they're going to engage with are, you know, fans, donors, and the board. And making sure that those voices on the board represent, you know, the entirety of our state and the entirety of um, ages was, was really important. Um, yeah. And uh, so I decided to do it the hard way. Um, was kind of told by the powers that be that this is not going to happen. And I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And I put, you know, 15, 16,000 miles on my car going wow. from town to town throughout the state. I went to the Upper Peninsula in February, which is <laughs> not wise. It's, it's one of the most beautiful places in the country. Unless Maybe you're not in February? <laughs> into snow. I would recommend June, July, and August for the yeah. Peninsula. I think that's when I will take my visit. I, I yeah. grew up in Atlanta. I live in Florida. I, I don't really do snow well unless I'm downhill skiing. Other than that, I have no interest in it. So I will book a summer trip. <laughs> Perfect. So go to the Upper Peninsula. Go to Pictured Rocks in July. It's beautiful. Lake Superior is still cold, but it's gorgeous. Um, but I went there in February because that's when uh, the Democratic clubs – wanted me up there. And so the thing is that they're also nominated by the parties yep. at their state party convention. So I had to get a number of activists to agree to put me on the ballot. And I, you know, for lack of a word, just busted ass to make it happen. And, uh, you know, we, we ended up winning a contested convention. Um, there were three candidates for two spots and uh, ended up on the November 2018 ballot for an eight year term uh, winning the top statewide with 1.75 million votes, um, which awesome. was um, kind of mind blowing at the time um, and has been just a truly remarkable experience. Yeah. Uh, even despite the difficulties which we've had, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, yes. <laughs> but, I, but I think that Michigan is in a better place, and I think universities are in a better place when their governance uh, reflects the totality of their, um, of their institutions. And yeah. sometimes, you know, when we see this get in trouble, we see this right up the road, um, at MSU, uh, when, when governing boards are not functioning effectively, it makes it a lot harder for universities to function. effectively, yeah. And that's yeah. You know, part of what we've seen. Well, and just having that viewpoint where you're not so far removed from the student experience. I don't know if I told you this when you and I spoke before, but I was on the board of trustees at my undergrad as a very, I was in my 20s when I was on that board because I went to a very small private liberal arts institution, Oglethorpe University in Atlanta, and they actually reserve a board spot specifically for a young alumni member. And I can't remember if you had to have graduated in the last five years or in the last 10 years, but it was shortly after I had graduated from law school. So I was only in my mid twenties at the time and wasn't that far removed from having gone to, you know, I, I was like four years post-graduation at that point. And it was so illuminating, you know, the things I learned being part of that. And I happened to be on the board when they were considering adding sports, which was very interesting at that point in my career. I had started blogging about college sports, but I had not made a career of it yet. I was still practicing law in an area that had nothing to do with sports, but being part of that conversation. And as we weighed, not only were we going to add sports, but which sports we were going to add and the, you know, what we needed facilities wise, just all the things that go into that decision. I that conversation still comes up in my mind all the time when I write about other schools adding or cutting sports. And I learned so much by just being in the room and hearing that conversation. So I don't know how many schools effort to have a younger, uh, you know, member on the board of trustees or the board of regents. But to me, it makes a lot of sense because you are so much closer to that student experience and can weigh in on, well, no, this is how it really works as a student. You think it plays out this way, but like practically here's how it plays out. I think that voice is really needed. So, um, you know, I think having someone like yourself on the board of regents there at Michigan is huge for them. Yeah. And I, I would tell you that, um, you know, when we were going through the worst of our COVID year, 
um, which where we were on campus and then we were totally closed and then we were back on. Um, I, I, I had a I developed a really close relationship with the student body president and vice president. And part of the reason why we were able to develop that relationship was because they felt that they could come to me and talk to me about things that they couldn't talk to the other regents about. Yeah. That's okay. Um, you know, there, there needs to be lots of different perspectives. I'm not suggesting that an older person shouldn't serve on the board. I think yeah. of course they should, but I think you need both. Um, yeah. I think you need that mix of experiences. And I think it helped me when I, I was vice chair at the time, it helped me guide me through the decisions we had to make. Um, but also, um, it really sharpened my thinking as a board member on yeah. what the responsibility meant and who was most important that, you know, it's not necessarily just the donors and the alumni and faculty, it's the students at the end of the day who, who you're right. doing a service for. Um, that's, that really centers it. Um, and it, it really centers my thinking when it comes to all, um, all the things I do as a board member. So you had to deal with COVID, and I would imagine now you've also had to deal with quite a number of sports issues. Um, but I bet the average person listening to this doesn't really know at what level the Board of Regents might discuss or get involved in athletic-related decisions. So without revealing anything confidential, can you just give us a little taste for how often does athletics come up in your meetings and anything you can share about uh, the types of subject matter you're discussing? Yes. Yeah, so um, as you can imagine, uh, athletics is extraordinarily important to the University of Michigan. Um, we like to look at it even as a public school. It's the front door to the university. Right. When I was campaigning, uh, most people have interactions with Michigan in two ways. Either they have an opinion about the football team, which they're happy to share, or <laughs> they have a family member who went to one of our medical centers. Um, that's the way that most Michiganders interact with Michigan. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, it, it's important. Um, it's important, uh, and it comes up a lot because of the reputational value of the institution through athletics. And I'll give you the yeah. perfect example of it. Um, I'm sure if you ever talk to a Michigan alum, they'll be happy to tell you that Michigan beat Ohio State 42-27 last year and went to the college football playoff. <laughs> um, and so the question becomes, what kind of impact does it have on an, us as an institution? What's well, huge? We had almost 90,000 applications last year. And while, of course, uh, we can talk about the great academics, uh, the great professors, Ann Arbor, it's a wonderful place to go to school. Yeah. There is a level of Michigan being that public that says, you know, there are going to be kids out there who may not have applied or thought about applying and say, oh, yeah. Michigan, I wonder, you know, is that a good school? And finding out, you know, it's one of the best public schools in the world. Yeah. Um, and, you know, being comfortable with that, being the best at everything is something that's really important to our alumni. So it comes up a lot is, is the, <laughs> the best way of saying it. Um, and even though it is just a tiny portion of the full portfolio of the university, it's one of the three most important uh, uh, parts of the Ann Arbor campus. Um, yeah. you know, we, we, there are people that joke to us that we are a... Uh, a hospital and a football stadium with a school attached. Um, and sometimes it feels that way just because of the size of both, but the reputational value of both is huge above and beyond um, what, you know, what, what most academics would, would be comfortable with. Yeah. Um, but that's okay because for most kids, you know, they're, they're, you know, myself included, I will fully admit to you that I studied hard in high school because I wanted to sit in the student section at Michigan games. <laughs> like, okay, whatever gets you to do it. But there are a lot of kids <laughs> outside the state who have that first interaction is through athletics. Um, yeah. So it's a really important part of it. Now, you know, one of the things, and I hear, I see this on message boards a lot, that people are insist the regions are meddling and, you know, play calling and who's the coach almost never comes up. Uh, I have never had a discussion with the athletic director about anything like that. And I'm pretty confident that most board members haven't. Um, but we talk about our values a lot. Uh, our yeah. values in athletics matter a lot. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll give you an example, um, one that, I, that I've spoken about, so it won't be a bit of a secret, but it's, it's an important inside um, the way we look at it from a board perspective. So everyone remembers back to the 2020 football season, uh, our football team didn't play as well as we had hoped. Um, and people were talking about whether Coach Harbaugh was going to be out 
out the door. Um, when it came to the football itself, that's a ward manual decision. It should be a ward manual decision. It's the athletic director's call, whether the coach uh, can live up to what's required of them, you know, mm -hmm. field success. But when Ward comes to us and says, I'd like to extend Coach Harbaugh, it's a little bit of a conversation about the play on the field and more of how does he fit into our values as an institution? Are players going to class? Are players graduating? Uh, are people getting into trouble? Uh, what kind of camaraderie do we have in the locker room? Things like that. Mm -hmm. And those are things where the board is a little less deferential uh, because the values are across our institution. We ask the same questions right. as we would if someone at the medical center, someone in uh, in the you know the school of literature, science, and the arts was asking that. We want to make sure that everyone, everyone on our campus fits our values, and that's the the big first place where athletic fits in athletics fits into the board. The second one is obviously we're we're, we're focused on the way our athletic campus looks and the and. You know, it seems like every month a new building is approved somewhere on our campus. We just approved um, a new scoreboards and a new uh, media center uh, for football and basketball that actually is going to work for all of our sports. So obviously th that is a that's a big part of it. And the third part that we have a conversation about is the changing face of college athletics. Um, and for us, all of our work is affected by. Uh, what goes on when it when it comes to Big Ten expansion, when it mm -hmm. goes to changes in NIL, when it goes to, you know, the Big Ten's new TV deal. Um, these are all things that the board cares about as fiduciaries. Um, it's really important to us that we are protecting what I view and my colleagues view as the most important um, thing in the state of Michigan, and that is um, our, our brand and our um, and our institution. We've got so many changes in college athletics that we can talk about, and we're going to have time to talk about, I think, a lot of them. So I want to ask you, if you had to pick out of all the things, NIL, conference expansion, television contract, you know, the transfer portal, everything under the college athletics umbrella, what do you think is the biggest priority or concern for regents? Yeah, so I think that the biggest two, there's two actually. I'll, I'll, okay. There's two. This is a, I'll let you have two. <laughs> he says, oh, you can never just have one answer. <laughs> I think the changing landscape of TVs and um, conference expansion is a huge part of it. Um, that is the biggest day to day impact on our student athletes mm -hmm. and on the way that, that our athletic department functions. Um, and the second one, of course, is NIL. Um, those two those two changes are massive, and they make a um, that they, they fundamentally change the way the university has a relationship with our student athletes, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a among uh, both my colleagues and frankly among colleagues at other universities who I have a chance to meet and talk to, there's a lot of nervousness right now about both. Yeah, um, people are really nervous about. Uh, when the when the music stops, the musical musical chairs of the Big Ten expansion, where they're going to be, and people are really nervous about. Well, does this lead to does NIL lead to employment status? Does it lead to a change in the way that we um, that the TV contracts give out money to to the schools? And those right. are, you those got that house suit right now, all yeah. about the television money and potentially going back to 2016 to divide that money with football and men's and women's basketball, and they just. Uh, we're going to record this less than a week before it's going to come out for everybody here. So this will all be pretty current. But um, in that case, they just filed we just two... like two pieces and be like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. If this happens, listen to a, if this happens, you know, to choose your own adventure, <laughs> but you know, they're trying to turn that into a class action and uh, that could certainly be very interesting. And they're going at, we won't get into, we're both lawyers, so I'm sure we could dig into this, but we will spare the listeners. Um, but they're going in front of judge Wilkins who was in the beginning stages of the O'Bannon trial and the Alston trial. And, you know, she has been a pretty pro student athlete, I would say, uh, overall. So I think it's it's scary for athletic departments and for universities. But without, without digging into that one too much, um, I'm curious on the conference expansion front and just the, the television contract and just conference level kind of stuff. Do the regents interface at all with anyone at the Big Ten, or is that something that primarily your president or your athletic director are handling? 
we, so obviously many of our board members have relationships with folks at the Big Ten and at other universities, um, but, but it's really important that our athletic director and a president have a central role in that. And frankly, one of the reasons why we hired Santa Ono to be the president of U of M from UBC and then before that from Cincinnati was because of his deep knowledge and understanding of these issues, uh, that he wouldn't show up on day one, which was just last Friday, by the way, <laughs> someone who didn't know anything, who had to get comfortable with the idea of college athletics when he's already done it. Uh, he built this, yeah. you know, he, he was primarily responsible for a lot of the building of their football and men's basketball programs at Cincinnati, the buildings that really have pushed them forward from an athletic base. So him coming in, even though he spent four years uh, or five years in Canada, uh, he kind of hit the ground running. Um, yeah. So from a board perspective, you want someone to engage with it. You want someone to be a leader and to understand your institutional values and not say, oh, well, I, we're just taking the money and I'm not I'm not thinking about it beyond that. Because that's what a lot of chancellors and presidents do, quite frankly. Yeah. They I'm always shocked by how few of them understand college athletics. I mean, I've been brought in to talk to new presidents and give them like a state of the union about what college athletics looks like right now and how the finances of college athletics work. And the first time I ever got asked to do that, like I was just completely stunned. This was super early on in my career. I was probably in my late twenties at the time. And I thought, you want me to come educate your president on college athletics? It just like blew my mind, but they had hired someone who came from a smaller institution that did not have a division one athletic program. And he wanted to understand, but he did not at that stage. I believe he's actually still at that school. So I think he's been doing a pretty good job, but uh, <laughs> not from what I said, but, um, um, I I really was shocked by that as somebody who was kind of making my transition from being a fan to being a sports business reporter at that point in time. Um, as a fan, I would have thought like the president's really got it, but now I know that that's not always the case. No, it's not, and you know it scares presidents. A lot of them come from acad academia where mm -hmm. college athletics uh, is looked down upon. Um, you know, I, like I said, when I told you earlier that, you know, the way our, our football team performs affects both donations and it affects applicants that gets, uh, oh my God, you say that out loud and, 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 and from the world that a lot of presidents come from, um, and a lot of presidents, there's a lot of faculty that will push back at that. They like, they don't want to hear it. They don't believe it. There, there's no evidence you can show them that they will ever believe. <laughs> they don't want to, and that's okay. They don't have to. Um, but they also benefit from the flip side of it as well. Um, so I think when you when you have someone who comes from academia and they're stepping into an extraordinary complex, you know, Fortune 500 level company that where they're there have all these different issues all the time, it makes sense that they're not necessarily going to have focused on it when they were provost or when they were, yeah. um, you know, the whatever the dean at uh, at another school. Um, but I think that part, what's happened then, and this is not necessarily a good thing, is that you have the uh, athletic side, you know, kind of wagging the dog uh, when it comes to the way the school operates. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily a good thing either. Um, we need strong chancellors and strong presidents to step up and say, what are the academic ramifications of this? What does this look like for my school? How does it impact the impact that my school can have on our state, on our, on our region, based on yeah. what conference we're in. Um, you know, athletic directors are really important. We're lucky that we've got a great one. But athletic directors are focused on athletics and presidents are focused on the whole of institutions. And that's how it should be. And a healthy tension there is important, but it also requires the presidents to have knowledge and the standing to be able to push back. Yeah. And that for me is, you know, what I see as a board member is one of the most important things is having a president who understands, who's willing to get in there and really um, and really push back as to what's most important for our institution and frankly, what we think is best for the conference as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I love NIL. <laughs> yes. And when you and I spoke before, we talked a lot about NIL. My audience knows that that is my thing these days. So I'm really curious, as we were leading up to that July 1st, 2021 date, when we all knew it was likely coming online, what were those conversations like with your board in terms of trying to understand it and how it was going to impact Michigan and college athletics in general? So I will give a 
quick humble brag to myself real quick. So I actually spoke up in favor of granting NIL rights from the board table in December of 2019. And the response I got internally was pretty negative that this is never going to happen. This is, you know, it's not, not going to be a thing that we have to deal with. And once it happened, um, there were two schools of thought. And I think this is, by the way, this is not a Michigan specific thing. This is an everyone. No. Yeah. The first one is, and everyone feels this way, is that we got to jump in and do everything right away or we're going to fall behind. Mm -hmm. Second level is we got to do nothing <laughs> because we're Michigan and we don't need to do any of this stuff to not fall behind. And I fall somewhere in the middle. Obviously, I think you need to have a robust NIL program, but also realize that it's not the end all be all to developing good college sports programs. So yeah. I think there's a lot of nervousness. Uh, there still is. Um, what is this? What kind of impact does this have on uh, our student athletes? How does this change their mindset uh, when they're in, you know, when they're in a, on our campus? Michigan has a huge brand and um, both marijuana and gambling are legal in the state of Michigan. So there's a, you know, a pull to say yeah. how we make sure that student athletes are engaging in this new activity NIL without engaging in these other new legal activities and protecting their own reputations, protecting their own yeah. brands. So I think there's a lot of a fear about this, understandably, but I think that as time has gone on, people have realized around my board table and around with our athletic director and our, our new president that this is an opportunity for Michigan. You know, we are never the school as any Michigan alum will famously tell you that we're not gonna give people the bag. It's not the way Michigan has ever operated. Um, but the big part of the reason why is because we don't need to. You know, there's a reason why three out of the top five college football games in 2021 involve Michigan. Right, that we like to tell, but it's not a coincidence. We can tell recruits that. So if you want to come build your brand, there's probably no better school in the country to go to than the University yeah. of Michigan, just because it's of its global reach, the wealth of our alumni, et cetera. Um, and we've slowly realized that um, this is going to be an all of campus approach that's most successful for us. Yeah. Um, you know, we obviously, we have collectives, um, you know, we have an outside, uh, marketing company Valiant, which does amazing work, actually the first uh, first outside company to have a in stadium NIL store uh, at the big house, which is incredible. Um, but Michigan's nervous about these things, and um, combining these two things, the there's two competing things at Michigan in everything, and the first one is um, that store that sort of conservative small C that Bo Schembechler was known for. We're going to run the football and we're going to run it better than everybody else. Oh, by the way, that's the worst Bo imitation you'll ever hear. You <laughs> can do a, do a Bo we get the point. But yeah. <laughs> One side of it versus the incredibly, um, the, the innovative side, the side that, you know, brought the University of Michigan, the polio vaccine and the first, you know, all, all Michigan crew in space, those kinds of, that kind of innovation. And there's a constant tension there. And this tension just finds itself in athletics at this point. Um, yeah. And figuring that out is, um, it's a long-term project, especially when you have a situation where there is so much money flowing from television into the pockets of the university. Um, that hangs over everything now. Um, it, you know, it seems at times uh, that uh, that Fox runs the conference um, and uh, that is scary for a lot of people. It should be scary. You know, this that 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 is um, a central concern, um, not that the Fox people are bad, but just because, you know, no. they have different values. And but so other conferences feel that way about ESPN. It's not unique to Fox at all. A big part of it is because the, the conference, you know, started with the Big Ten Network and and Fox, and it, it was brilliant for everyone. It's done yeah. wonderfully for the conference, but there is there's all these sorts of long term concerns um, that are reasonable, and that that our board and our president and our athletic director just find ourselves working through. Um, and then, of course, the thought, like I said before, of everybody else is doing it better than we are, and we got to get it be as good as them. And I think there's a lot of that going on right now. And I, I encourage people, especially in our in, on the internal side, like, yes, we have more work to do, but take a deep breath. 
that 80% of what you hear in the media that somebody else is doing isn't exactly what they say. Um, that there are definitely a lot of schools doing really innovative things. Um, but are there... But you guys are too. We are I mean, too. Look, I'm a Florida fan and I will give credit where credit is due. And there have been a lot of stories I have written or that someone else on my business college sports team has written about things that Michigan has done first or been among the first. I remember Imden, B, I think, was the first I saw that had co-branded merchandise in the store last football season. Not this, you know, a lot of folks are just getting it online this season, but Imden had it last season. And I know I just did a story about the graduate hotel there in Ann Arbor and this art gallery they've got with NFTs that are co-branded between athletes in Michigan. So I feel like as an outsider looking in who has no ties to Michigan myself, that I've seen some really innovative and forward thinking things coming out of Michigan. It, it has been. And a big part of it is that we have really innovative student athletes and we have really innovative alumni that love this and love to, you know, to your point about the MDEN. Well, as I said, it's not just our downtown locations that have the, it's in the big house. Yeah. So you can go, you know, JJ McCarthy has a great first half against Michigan State this Saturday. Um, you can go <laughs> in at halftime and you can go get yourself a JJ McCarthy jersey and he gets a very significant percentage of that in his pocket. Those are good things. These are good things yeah. for the institution. They're good things for our student athletes. Um, and, and frankly, these are going to help us on the recruiting front. Um, you know, everyone, everyone likes to complains and says, oh, you're not doing enough. You're not, you know, the collective doesn't have enough. This is uncharted territory for us. Yeah. Um, and, and our donors aren't, um, you know, there are donors that are, have been giving substantially collectives, but the reality is, is that I think our donors feel not unfairly that this is a, a kind of a bridge payment between now and whatever happens next, which I tend to think is going to be, um, is going to be some sort of revenue sharing model. But our, our donors are just not as comfortable with it as certain schools in the South might be, um, yeah. you know, and, and that's going to be okay. You know, Michigan's going to do it Michigan's way, um, but Michigan's always done it that way. And that's the secret that I think people, when people say, well, we're going to fall behind and this and that, it's like, look, in how, what year did Texas A&M give Eric Dickerson a car? We ended up winning the Big Ten the next year. It's fine. You know, we're going to get student athletes are going to come to Michigan first and foremost because of the quality education, the quality of training you're going to get here, the quality of facilities, and yes, an ability to be on national TV every week. Mm -hmm. That is a huge deal. Um, and are there going to be student athletes that make a lot of money through NIL at Michigan? Absolutely. But it's just never going to be a school where we're going to be doing recruiting inducements. It's just not. Um, it's just the nature of the school. And frankly, it's hard. It's not forever. Michigan is not for everybody. Um, and we, you know, as alumni and as, as regents, we, we are comfortable with this. I'm comfortable with this. But I'm also, I'm also comfortable with competing in our way in this space to be yeah. as successful as possible. So you brought up revenue sharing, and I, I tend to agree with you that that is where this seems to be heading. And I just had this conversation with somebody earlier this morning. And what I'm trying to reconcile in my brain and work out like what college athletics looks like down the road is if we go to revenue sharing, how is that done in a way that's fair and equitable and how does title nine impact the way that that's done and you know i don't think any of us know the answers to these questions but do you have any prognostications yeah what is your crystal ball telling you about what college athletics looks like in five years or ten years so i think that the biggest thing here is i think that the schools are going to do whatever it takes to avoid student athletes becoming employees i think that is the number one the number one priority for better or worse. And frankly, there's advantages to it. There are disadvantages to it. I'm kind of agnostic on this point. Even um, advantages and disadvantages to the student athletes themselves. That's what I mean. that there's, mm -hmm. there's no, there is no, there is no clear cut advantage uh, that I can see right now from being an employee versus some sort of student athlete or whatever they want to call it. Um, but I don't think that is sustainable without serious revenue sharing. Um, I think that you're going to be talking about it being a baseline payment across all student athletes at some point. Um, if I was structuring this, I would 
obviously you want to make sure you have as few Title IX issues as possible. You'd want to have a situation where maybe even the TV network, where BTN uh, is the one contracting individually with the student athletes uh, to cut the schools out in a way so they're not or yeah. the conference out so they're not stuck dealing with. Um, you know, any, any sort of Title IX issues. That would be my best bet. And that's probably the easiest way. But this Makes is sense. college athletics. Nothing ever comes. <laughs> um, and so my suspicion is, is that there's going to be, you know, we talked about the House decision. Obviously, that's a big one. Um, but what goes on in the U.S. House is actually going to be even more interesting because the NCAAs and their member schools are going to continue to plead and plead for congressional action. And this yeah. is a big prediction. It is not going to happen. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think that uh, the, the sides are very far apart. And I will tell you, as a, as a board, we met um, with Republican and Democratic senators uh, at the beginning of 2020 to talk about this. And bridging the gap between the two models was so far that I said at this point, this is just, frankly, it's not happening, at least for a very long time. Um, and so I think the NCAA is either going to have the they're going to have to figure this out. The conferences, not the NCAA, the conferences are going to figure this out yeah. along with their TV partners or a judge is going to order them to figure it out. Yeah. Um, I don't see a third option at this point, which is a shame because I think that a thoughtful model um, that comes in front of Congress might make a lot of sense. The problem is yeah. the what the student athletes want and what administration want are so different at this point. And what the models are presenting to, to members of Congress are so different that I just don't see it happening. Um, but I do, I can't see a situation where collectives are as important as they are now. Mm -hmm. I think that revenue sharing is going to become way more important um, because people are going to say, if I go to Michigan, I know that, you know, as a student athlete, I'm guaranteed X amount of dollars from the Big Ten deal every single right. year. And that's an easier thing to, it's no longer recruiting inducement. It's just part of the package. Yeah. Where, uh, now it's so much fishier than it should be. I mean, if you if you could design a system that would be as inefficient as possible, that's what we have right now. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I think adding on uh, the conferences into the sort of revenue sharing uh, through their TV partners makes a ton of sense. And I think that's where we're going to end up. But you know, your guess is as good as mine. And, you know, it's hard to know, you know, from being a lawyer, you never know what a judge is going to wake up and decide to do the next day. So right. these predictions are <laughs> as good as, only as good as a judge's mood. I have a feeling I know what Wilkin will do, but it's what happens past her that yeah. is less clear to me. <laughs> yeah, I, think that's, I think that's right. And, you know, I, I don't think anyone would have anticipated the Alston payments five or six years ago. There's right. That we haven't even thought about yet. That's probably going to come up. Um, that we're, we're going to have to start thinking about uh, as a board, as an institution, because it's going to impact our bottom line at the end of the day. Yeah. Michigan's lucky that we're you know, a very wealthy school, and a lot of schools don't have the sort of breathing room that Michigan does, Right. but is absolutely going to impact us um, along with conference realignment. Yeah. Okay. So we focused a lot on issues and like tending towards the negative things happening. Yeah. I want to end on a high note. Yeah. <laughs> What are you most excited about for college athletics in the next years, year or two, five years, however far out you want to go? What, where do you see opportunity for positive things, whether it's for the university or for student athletes, however you want to take that? So I'm going to pick two, one of my region hat and one of my fan hat. Okay. Throw in my <laughs> fan hat because it's my favorite. One. So, <laughs> it's more fun. <laughs> outside my window right now, it's beautiful. It's 70 degrees. By next weekend, it's going to be about 35. <laughs> I'm looking forward to expanded college football playoff that makes schools like your Florida Gators come up here and come play, play in that <laughs> weather. Okay. As, much as I enjoy playing Georgia in Miami on New Year's Eve, I want Georgia to come to the big house uh, <laughs> on New Year's Eve and see what that feels like. Um, so I think that's actually one of the things that I'm most excited about um, is – College, the greatest thing about college athletics is from a fan perspective is the environment. Um, it's been yeah. crazy that uh, the NCAA has moved in the hockey realm from playing on-campus games to these neutral sites. It kills yeah. what's great about college hockey. These, they should go back to the Yost and the, um, the, you know, the building at BU and, you know, all the things that make yeah. college hockey unique. Um, I think that people are going to find the same thing with the college football playoff. 
um, that being on campus is going to be a really special experience. Um, and um, if it were up to me, I would only have I'd have everything on campus except for, you know, the Fiesta Rose, Sugar and uh, Orange, everything else. Have it on campus. The environments will be incredible. Um, and I think it'll be great for everybody from a region perspective. What I'm most interested in seeing is how our Olympic sports NIL develops. Um, I think this is the biggest place where all of campus approach will help mm -hmm. those student athletes the most. And I'm looking forward to over the next years as academics start to get comfortable in the sports management room on, on this stuff on our campus, that there's more academic offerings, that there's more seminars and classes. Cause you know, no one really does education great or perfect right now. And yeah. this is a place where I think that schools can really fill a void um, that hasn't yet. So from a yeah. regional perspective, that is the one that I'm most excited to work on um, because I think the opportunities for uh, our Olympic student athletes, especially our female student athletes are yeah. huge. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get there. It's just, uh, it requires a lot of um, people accepting this is here and let's, let's move the institutions forward. Well, I am doing my part to help Michigan because I am mentoring one of your gymnasts, Sierra Brooks. Uh, I'm part of Meta's Female Empower program, and she was one of just 30 female student athletes chosen from hundreds and hundreds of applications. I did not have part of the selection process, but we are split into teams of 10, and she is one of my 10 young ladies. And so I have been talking to her about her personal brand and her NIL strategy. So that is how I am doing my part to help Michigan Olympic athletes get more out of NIL. Don't don't tell my uh, my friends at Florida where I actually teach NIL. Us, <laughs> but I think to your point, I mean, what you're doing is great and it's really important. Um, and having those relationships are huge. But the other part is we have a business school, we have law yeah. schools, we have these huge academic enterprises with similar experiences um, that we can really bridge that gap yeah. and can keep it, um, you know, as, as much as you can mentor for 10 people, you can't mentor 300 people. You don't have right. time for it, but our academic side can. Yeah. And I think as schools start to figure that out, you personally, this is my show for you, Christy. You <laughs> the, schools will need people like you to help them shape those, curric those curriculum. Yeah. That is really important. And, you know, I, I want to get away. And I've, I say this, Ward Manuel's going to hate that I said this, but it's it's true. <laughs> I want to get away from the sit and, le and be lectured at model of, yeah. of education on the side. No, everyone knows that an 18 to 22 year old student athlete is not sitting through a lecture. They're not getting credit or money for. It's just a reality. Yeah. I wouldn't have done it either. So getting to the point where this is part of academic curricula as a whole. Right is really important and it frankly makes recruiting visits easier. You could say, well, what do yeah. you do? Here's the classes, meet the professor. These are the sorts of things that schools can embrace. Yeah. Schools that embrace them well are actually going to recruit better. Just yeah. for quality. You, you are preaching to the choir because I have been trying to develop things at Florida. I teach NIL in two different programs there. Actually, I teach in the PR program, which is an interesting way to teach NIL, but non-athlete students are so much, I've told you this, but, and I know the audience has probably heard me say it. They're so much more interested in NIL than people are giving them credit for. And so the PR students actually ask to have NIL. And that's how UF approached me to teach that class was because of demand from non-athlete students. And then I got asked to also add it over in the sports management program, which is probably the more typical way to teach it. But I taught spring semester summer, and summer semester of this year in PR. And then this semester in the fall, I'm teaching it in both PR and sports management. And the vast majority of my students have been non-athletes. Um, but I have had a few athletes and here's where the problem is at Florida. And I think it's the problem at a, a lot of schools because I've heard other folks say this, other professors who are trying to help develop more robust NIL curriculum is most of the student athletes who want to take my classes can't because it's not in their major. They can't get credit for it. They, they 
aren't even able to sign up for it. They can't even see it in the system when they register for classes because it's outside of their major. And so I know a lot of, I, I'm still learning because this is my first like full year having taught at a university. Uh, I previously taught one class once upon a time, one semester at another school, but I'm still learning academia. But what I know about it so far yeah. at every school I've talked to is it's very siloed. And I, I'm sure there are other instances this is a problem for students too, but I think that's that's one problem that I know several schools are trying to solve is how can we offer these classes in all these different departments and allow student athletes to be able to take advantage of them when they're spread out among different departments? Because you do need experts in a bunch of different areas to really maximize your NIL knowledge and ability to execute. And I don't know ultimately what that will end up looking like, but I I'm trying to help lead the charge at UF. <laughs> I think that's right. And I think that you need to have, like I said, you need to have academic leadership that's really focused on breaking down those silos. Um, you know, we're, we're really lucky, obviously, with Dr. Ono and his team that they are really focused on that already. Um, but this also ultimately requires deans pushing in the same direction. It requires the provost pushing in the same direction. And I think that, like I said, the schools that get there or that figure this out are going to get there quick. Yeah. Because there's going to be tremendous opportunities. But it's got to, um, it does have to be an all of campus approach. It's just, yeah. that, it's that important. Um, you know, I, it's like the same way that uh, if our engineering school was like, no, we're going to teach about uh, horse-drawn carriages. We're not going to teach about electric cars. You'd say <laughs> that's the most ridiculous thing in the world. Of course, you're going to teach about electric cars. You have to think it the same way. This is the electric yeah. car for college athletics. And uh, a school like Michigan, like, uh, you know, schools that want to be competitive in this space, whether you're, you know, at the top of the Big Ten or whether you're in a group of five conference, you got to, to make this all of campus approach. It's the only way to be successful. Well, and it's not just athletics. You know, so many of the students who are in my class, the reason they're interested is because they have a large social media following themselves or they are an entrepreneur and they've already started a business on the side. You know, I think more and more the, the current generation that's in college, they are content creators and yes. they sort of understand that, uh, content creation economy that's happening and they want to figure out how can they do more of it and how can they work with brands and how can they get PR for their brand or their company. And so it's not just the athletes who need it. There are tons of students all across campus who need it and are interested in it as well. So although NIL has made us all sit up and pay attention because it deals with college athletics, right. I have met so many other students on campus who aren't athletes who want to do the same types of monetization uh, activities and, and can and have those opportunities. So uh, I, I'm big on, and Florida has been fabulous about it. I have to say, like, I've had so many professors and deans reach out to me and ask me more about the landscape and about the demand and about where this is going. So I think the the interest and the attitude is all headed in the right direction. Um, I, I'm just impatient. It's not happening fast enough for me, but it, it'll get there. <laughs> well, welcome to academia. Yes. <laughs> um, where, uh, you know, when I, when I joined the board, one of the best pieces of advice I got from previous board members member was it's like turning a ship all the time and if you only have one hand on the ship it's not going to turn you need to have three thousand hands on the ship and even then it just turns very slowly and i think that's a frustration a lot of people are going to have uh on both sides um yeah. but ultimately the ship is turning yeah. the ship is turning and we have to be okay with that academics yeah. need to be okay with that too Oh, well, I so appreciate you joining us and chatting about all of this. Uh, we already went a long, little longer than we planned, and I could keep talking to you about all this. So maybe we'll have to come back for a part two, you know, down the road when we've got some new things to talk about. But I so appreciate you joining us, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you again to Jordan Acker for joining us here on the Business of College Sports podcast. I think it was really interesting to hear his perspective as a regent on the state of college athletics and where we're headed and the things that concern him. And you know, I always love talking NIL, so it was great to talk NIL with him as well. 
Thank you to all of you for joining us here on the Business of College Sports podcast, whether you were listening or watching. If you don't know, the Business of College Sports podcast is now available on YouTube in video format if you prefer that over listening on your favorite podcast platform. Whether you're listening on a podcast platform or on YouTube, I would be so appreciative if you took time to rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform or give us that thumbs up over on YouTube and tell more folks about us. I'm so appreciative for you spending time with us and I will be back again next week with another great guest.